Hello and welcome to the debate. I'm your host, Rafik Bal, and in today's show, we'll be talking about two very important uh, topics. Of course, the first one being um, Adila Balut's escape, uh, a tale of uh, how she was rescued uh, from terror. In that regards, if you go into the backdrop of uh, the whole uh, tale that she has told, uh, Balochistan province witnessed a surge in terrorism as the militant groups were using vulnerable individuals for suicide attacks by manipulating or brainwashing them. A similar tale of Adila Baloch uh, was uh, seen today as she shared her story, where uh, she said that she was a nurse by profession who was brainwashed by the terrorists and coerced into militancy. She held a press conference sharing a story and raising awareness amongst the uh, youth of uh, the province regarding the modus operandi of these militant groups, of how they manipulate the youth and um, they use them for their nefarious purposes. A coordinated rescue operation was launched by the Balochistan government, which resulted in Adila's safe recovery from the mountainous areas of Balochistan province, after which she shared her story with the world. She also underscored the urgency of addressing radicalization, which is a threat to the future of the youth of the province. And uh, on the occasion, Adila's uh, father, uh, Khuda Baksh Baloch, also talked, and he stated that he had educated his daughter to become a nurse. But such uh, radical and extremist groups are a threat to the future of the Balochistan's youth. He also said uh, that um, uh, the, uh, the, on the people, the, the terrorists, on um, uh, the terrorists, the militants on the mountains that are uh, using uh, and inciting the people towards violence and extremism, they are also Baloch. Uh, the people dying um, are also Baloch. And he said, "What tradition is this of uh, the Baloch people, uh, which was never heard before of, uh, that uh, they are using uh, the others' daughters?" to carry out their nefarious designs. He shunned this and uh, said this, uh, these are not part of the Baloch traditions as uh, the militants have been using uh, this uh, narrative as well. Uh, with regards to that, we'll be talking about the different aspects of Adila Baloch's escape, how she was rescued from terror and uh, what she highlighted in front of the world, sharing her own tale of how she was uh, manipulated and brainwashed by these militant groups and how they were going to use her and exploit her for their own nefarious purposes. Um, in, in the second topic, we'll be talking about um, a major development regarding Pakistan's economic front as uh, the IMF's executive board approved a $7 billion extended fund facility for Pakistan. And of course, uh, in that regards, we know this was much anticipated as Islamabad had uh, earlier and time and time again expressed the desire to achieve uh, this extended fund facility as the government is undertaking reforms in different sectors, be it the taxation sector, be it uh, the energy sector, or we see efforts in, in the shape of the Special Investment Facilitation Council. We can see that the government uh, had a full-on approach and in that regard, the Prime Minister Shehbaz Sharif had also stated that he wants this to be the last extended fund facility that Pakistan seeks from the IMF or any loan that Pakistan seeks to stabilize its economy. We'll uh, discuss both of the topics in detail, uh, but before that, I'd uh, like some quick comments from Farooq Patafi on uh, this major economic development as he's uh, joined <laughs> us in the studios. Uh, with regards to that, uh, Farooq Patafi, the extended fund facility, $7 billion, um, IMF has approved for Pakistan. How do you comment on that? It's a major development. All right, uh, uh, Rafi, uh, not only it, uh, is it uh, uh, an important major development, but it is also something that Pakistan has been working hard to get. Uh, Pakistan, uh, remember, only a couple of years ago, we were struggling with the possibility of default. And then this prime minister, during his previous tenure, actually, at the end of the uh, previous program, he saved the day, went and got uh, an SBA, standby agreement, right? Uh, of, 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 you know, three billion. And after that, uh, speculation was whether Pakistan is going to get into a new program or not. And then Pakistan uh, found a way uh, to get uh, the, uh, you know, staff level agreement. Mm -hmm. But there, because it was front loaded and there were many demands uh, that you had to actually fulfill before it was presented to the board. Uh, continuously speculation was that perhaps the, this program is not going to take off or perhaps this month we are not going to see the staff, uh, well, not staff but board actually approving, IMS board approving the, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. But uh, we have seen that uh, the finance minister and the finance team actually worked diligently under the leadership of prime minister and Pakistan has managed to acquire uh, this very crucial uh, fund facility. It is for 37 months, 
And in those 37 months, of course, it is a trade-off. Pakistan is trying to reform. So there are many things that Pakistan has to actually fulfill, many conditionalities. One of them is Pakistan has to maintain uh, or mm -hmm. show a GDP surplus of 4.2 per percent. And that would actually mean a lot. Uh, in this fiscal year, it is a primary a surplus has to be 1 percent. After that, of course, it will continue to increase and Pakistan has to maintain 4.2. So mm. uh, taxation uh, will have to be, uh, targets will have to be met. Uh, whatever promises we have made on SOEs or for the uh, reforms on state-owned enterprises, they, ha they will have to be met. And then there is the issue of uh, special economic zones. Pakistan will have to uh, phase them out by year uh, 2035. And in many aspects, uh, a lot of uh, expenditures will be frozen. Their targets will be frozen for con uh, qu quite some time. So mm. um, on one side, because uh, uh, you know IMF is the lender of last resort, uh, and because it is supposed to be a doctor from whom you need a bill of uh, a clean bill of health mm. to actually go and further function in the ec economy. But once IMF approves. Other, uh, other sources open up as well. We have seen ADB actually stepping in, mm. World Bank also stepping in, and Pakistan has started connecting with a, lo a lot of other opportunities. As long as you are functioning within the IMF's program, and uh, uh, if uh, the current uh, uh, commitment uh, of uh, this being the last <coughs> program is correct, then Pakistan does not need to worry. Mm. Eventually, things are going to become very good for the country. Well, uh, definitely, for Khudafi, as always, that's a great breakdown of uh, the whole development uh, that we've seen. And it's a major development uh, that we've seen regarding uh, Pakistan's uh, uh, economy and uh, the efforts that are being put in for the revitalization of economy. We'll uh, come back to the topic and discuss it in detail. But before that, I'd like to move towards our first topic uh, when we talk about uh, the return of Adila Baloch as uh, the Balochistan government had uh, launched a um, coordinated rescue operation to rescue Adila Baloch from the mountains. And uh, as she was um, brainwashed and manipulated uh, by these militant and terror groups. To talk on this topic, we've been joined in the studios uh, by senior analyst Prof. Dafi. Along with that, we have been joined by geopolitical analyst Roger Fessel. And on Skype, we have been joined by Brigadier Retired Harris Nawaz, who is a security analyst. I'll start from Brigadier Harris. And uh, considering uh, the situation that we've seen today, uh, there was a development. We saw the press conference uh, by Adila Baloch. Uh, but with regards to the situation, how do you comment on it overall? As uh, in the press conference, she very clearly stated how these militant groups, they manipulate and brainwash the youth of the province to, uh, to further exploit them to carry out their nefarious designs. You see, the Pakistan is, uh, I think, fighting terror for the last two decades. And now it's a new phenomenon in Blochism, particularly where Bloch have a lot of respect for ladies, girls, Whatever the disputes, enemy, girl, lady, they are all respected. But the first time we have seen, and now they are being used as shields against her terrorism. And what all happened, the way Adila has disclosed how she was lured in, she was being washed, then she was given a lot of attractions, and the life is very good. After a few years, you will see what Rustan is going to prosper. And ultimately, she will land in barren, all mountains around, and nothing available. Less few disgruntled boys and girls who have been lured in and given a lot of hooks, and that's where they were sitting over there. She, she clearly told you. I think we must give a lot of credit to her father, who informed the security forces that his daughter had gone. Otherwise, she was again a fit case to be shown as a, a missing person. And ultimately, missing person, the ultimate uh, is that they are either killed or they are apprehended and then disclose so many things. But the point is, they don't want particularly the Arbus Agency that Blochistan must do economic prosperity. Please remember, we are an Islamic country, we are a nuclear country, our military is really fighting army, our geostrictal location is good, and we have economic prosperity, we'll take independent decision and national interest. That is the thing they don't want to do us. And that's a clear example that CPAC should not be completed, Gwadar port should not be operationalized, because that is a great jump of point to Pakistan to go economically doing. And I think the people of Pakistan are going to be very, very happy in their own country with the government also. 
So in Dash Kurtha, we I give a lot of credit to Vinity Forces with their professionalism and the total personal interest of Chief Minister Jana Simanir. Things are now happening and their terrorist morale is going down. When they're using women as shields means their fighting capacity is going down. They're losing heart. And then is a time when sad girls say come open and give interview means they disclose the reality what is over there. And it goes in the hearts and mind of the young people who are being trying to be lured or potential uh, ter terrorists who is going to fall into the hand of this hostile intelligence, in particularly BLA and BFF and Majid Brigade. They are the persons who are misleading them. So I think it is a big catch. And after that, the interview of the father, mother, and Adila is going to go a long way. And I think what I personally feel, this girl should be taken to the universities and colleges. She must give her own practical experience, what she's seen there, how she was treated, how the other few youngsters are being treated, so that it becomes a lesson, an example for others not to do and fall prey to the Indalese hostile agencies, including BLA, BLF. That is very, very important, and you must have realized that the DGISPR, in his statement, recent press conference, has categorically told that military can kill terrorists, security forces can kill terrorists, but if you want to finish terrorism, the whole nation, the whole organ of the society, the elements of national power, all have to be united and harmonized toward one goal to eliminate terrorism from the country. For that, important is the illegal spectrum. Then is, of course, flow of money. Then we have to improve the capacity of the armed forces by Azmeh Sakam, for which we know the most affected province are Bolshistan and, and KPK, and the KPK PTI government, Malana Fazlur Rahman, and ANP. They did not agree to it. I'm surprised your people are being killed. Our Pashtun brothers are being killed, and you're not supporting. So that is that provinces have to support. Do provinces mm. have to be there? The nation has to stand behind the armed forces. Then things can happen. Otherwise, the supreme sacrifices of military, professional military, killing of terrorists will not end terrorism. Terrorism will have to be end, ended with when the all forces are going together and the nation is hiding behind armed forces. That is the recipe to end terrorism for Pakistan. Well, definitely, it's an issue of national interest. And of course, there should uh, be a national concerted effort towards its eradication. With, ra with that, I'd like to include Raja Faisal in the conversation. As Brigadier Harris, he, uh, he uh, highlighted some very important points. Uh, especially uh, in regards to that, I'd like uh, you to analyze one of the statements given by Adila Baloch as well when she talked about how she had not informed her family members when uh, she was um, uh, being um, uh, going uh, towards uh, her expedition of uh, being involved with these militants. With regards to that, how would you comment on the issue of um, uh, disappearing missing persons and how uh, the people who are using this uh, to, um, uh, to further carry out their designs, to further uh, polarize the society and to create divide within the society and secondly um, uh, how would you comment on the manipulation of the youth as uh, um, as uh, the father of Adila Baloch has also said uh, that uh, using someone's daughter for to carry out their own designs their terrorist militant designs is, is not part of Baloch traditions he questioned uh, what kind of Balochism is this yeah uh, Rafi I mean uh, when I obviously uh, you know was watching uh, this uh, uh, press conference I mean I'm someone who has daughters. Mm. Uh, I'm a father of daughters as well. To me, uh, Adila Baloch, be it Adila Baloch or Marang Baloch, they are daughters of the nation as well. I mean, I have created a very soft corner for people who are uh, considered as missing right now. Reason being, they are the very people who are actually prey of these uh, you know, dangerous people, BLA people who are intentionally using our daughters, using our sons to be, of course, against their own nation. This is what their design is. And to me, it reminds the story of uh, Hassan bin Sabah, in which, of course, we, we know that he created assassins, Hashashins, and uh, the assassins he created, it is such a, such a story that is quite similar to that. I mean, his dirty designs, they were so uh, similar to BLA's designs. Mm. I mean, Adila Baloch is someone who's been sent by her father, trusted by her father to be a doctor. This is what 
her ambitions were and she ends up being a nurse but still i mean her father says hmm. that i wish she could have become doctor but where does she end up she ends up uh, under the mechanized system of uh, BLA through which they brainwash the youth and they intentionally do it because they believe with these kind of uh, you know incidents of course they can uh, create uh, uh, havoc in Balochistan and Pakistan and they can portray uh, the uh, you know state of Pakistan as the villain in front of the whole world mm -hmm. and their uh, uh, you know their struggle the armed struggle which they consider struggle but of course is uh, you know terrorist and recognized as terrorism from the western world as well they consider it or claim to be as a freedom struggle but mm. uh, at the other hand of course they are doing nothing but just the Has hassan bin sabah's designs they are following that and the only reason they are following it for is of course uh, uh, you know their uh, designs they are suitable for uh, uh, when it comes to uh, you know uh, the powers they want them to of course uh, uh, create this havoc mm. and to of course hit uh, cpac uh, and the uh, fdis which are mm. coming to pakistan and they want to hit that as well what they want to declare is that uh, Balochistan does not belong to Pakistan, which, of course, uh, as uh, Farooq always highlights it, and I will highlight the same as well, only 1,500, 1,500 Majid brigades or BLA, the armed people, again and again, they hide somewhere and they mm. come back and they do carry out a uh, few activities and they once again disappear. They are the ones who are actually, uh, you know, doing it uh, at the hands of uh, uh, four agencies of Pakistan. And when it comes to the disappeared people, I mean, uh, when I see people like Marang Baloch, she's a doctor. She's intelligent enough to understand whatever is going on. I mean, the people she's highlighting, has she ever raised these questions in front of BLA? Mm. She should go to BLA and protest in front of BLA. Ask them, where are other Adila Baloch? Mm. Where are other Adil Baloch? For the sake of argument, I would say. There mm. would be many Adil Baloch and there would be many Adila Baloch who are at the hands of BLA committing these atrocities. But to me, even they are innocent in this uh, dirty game because this whole nexus and this uh, whole mechanism is uh, is a sin which is carrying uh, which is being carried out by BLA and BLF mm. and I believe Marang Baloch she really uh, you know needs to think about it and she really needs to raise these questions in front of BLA BLF. Well, um, there's always time for self uh, introspection as uh, Dila Baloch has also talked about it that uh, she did not have it in mind uh, when she was being manipulated and blackmailed. But of course, she did realize what, sh uh, what was happening was wrong. And uh, of course, uh, she did not want to be a part of those people. And with that regards to that, I'd like to include uh, Farooq Badafi in the conversation as well and uh, ask him with regards uh, to what we've seen, how these extremist elements, the radical elements, the militant groups, uh, they've been using um, um, they've been promoting and using um, um, these um, ex uh, extremism and they've been promoting their extremism, their radicalism in the guise of Baloch nationalism. But yeah. we've also seen that there's people like Gulzar Imam Shambe who have shunned these people and have talked about how they need to throw away their weapons and they need to become a part of the mainstream for their issues to be uh, addressed. How do you comment on that? Uh, right. Uh, I think that one has to acknowledge uh, at the outset uh, when you mentioned uh, Shambay, mm. I think that that is uh, one of the huge, uh, one of huge ac accomplishments of uh, the outgoing DGISI. Mm -hmm. I think under his leadership, the whole thing actually, uh, the, the guy actually returned to the fold of civilization. So we should have that, did that also. Mm -hmm. uh, now I, uh, I want to answer your question and I'm going to, but let me clarify a few things first. Well, first of all, uh, BLA might be 1,500, you know, in total in strength. Uh, the total size of Majid Brigade is said to be between 150 to 200. Mm -hmm. That is an, uh, a generous estimate. Right, uh, for Badafi, I'd uh, love to hear your, uh, what you are saying, but I'll have to cut you short and uh, we have to take a short break.
Welcome back. Starting off our conversation from where we left off, Farouk Badafi, you were commenting on the situation in uh, Balochistan province and uh, how uh, these militants uh, are uh, and uh, commenting on the modus operandi of these militant groups. Right. Uh, thank you very much, Rafi, for uh, uh, that intervention. But, um, uh, you know, I was commenting, uh, actually co correcting facts or um, creating some kind of distinction between Majid Brigade mm -hmm. and then BLA. Uh, Majid Brigade is total 150 to 200 people, and that is a general, uh, uh, a generous uh, estimate. And then BLA amounts to somewhere around 1,500. But we would know for sure because a lot of people uh, 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 might have quit or left the entire arena. But that is one aspect. Uh, I don't know why Faisal actually brought in <laughs> uh, the mention of uh, Hassan bin Sabah. It might, he might be a controversial uh, figure, but that is a very different story in history. Actually, if you want to look at the uh, uh, modus of trendai of these terrorists, particularly this uh, fresh infusion of women hmm. in terrorism, uh, you remember that in 2022, there was uh, one attack by Shari Baloch in, in Karachi. And after that, of course, a, a lot of people started speaking a lot about women being included uh, or becoming a part of this kind of terrorist attacks. Mm. What people did not examine is was the system of blackmail that continues. Shari Baloch had, uh, you know, children, um, uh, uh, a life, and uh, through that, a lot of, uh, you know, blackmailing can take place. Let me refresh everybody's memory because that is also an important milestone in Pakistan sad, tragic history of yeah. suffering terrorism. And that was back in 2000s when the war on terror started. In Iraq, there was uh, one person called Abu Masab Zarqawi. Uh, uh, reportedly, he came to uh, our neck of the woods as well before he was uh, eliminated in 2006. Uh, before that, of course, Pakistan started seeing these low-intensity suicide bombings and later on they became very active also. And that included children and women also, volunteers. And at that time, women were threatened by their families, their husbands, that if you don't, and if you don't blow up, um, uh, you know, commit suicide bombing, then you are going to be declared Kali and mm. then you are going to be disowned and then killed. So natural, and your children, of course, will be snatched from you. Um, uh, this is uh, the first person account because I used to cover war and terror. I went in those areas and met some of those survivors of such kind of activities or su such hostile uh, propaganda campaigns. And I realized what kind of social pressures might be on women to kill themselves in such a way. So uh, today, Adila Baloch's uh, uh, statement uh, her, um, you know, uh, talking about the modus of Tendai of the terrorist and how she was actually lured and then she was kidnapped and the kind of pressures she must have gone through is also reminiscent of exactly that. And what, what you need to do is, first of all, we have to actually work on rebuilding because in conflict zones, mm. uh, social connections also start failing. And this is what happened in FATA also because, uh, ex FATA, because uh, there, uh, um, the partisans of TTP in those days actually created such an environment of fear. And then there were so many volunteers also uh, helping them. For example, we went to, um, uh, you know, one of the agencies and there they saw, uh, they showed us, uh, the uh, our law enforcement showed, uh, showed us those caves th mm. where TTP used to hide, and in front of those caves were transformers. So that means that local electric power board must have helped them. Mm. So with that kind of a pressure and division in the society, terrorists always succeed in garnering more strength. So first of all, you have to actually start focusing on social reconstruction mm. of uh, uh, places like Balochistan, it is going to be a very uh, hectic topic uh, or job because Balochistan's population is scattered mm. in a very, very small, very large landscape. But once you, you do it 
and then you actively go against terrorists, you can expose them and then uh, clear out all their hideouts. So ensure that, uh, by ensuring that, you can also ensure that such kids or children of this society, daughters of this society, are not actually taken hostage and used for nefarious purposes by the terrorists. Right, uh, definitely. That's uh, that's a very good breakdown of how uh, this and then needs to be moved uh, forward, and uh, the situation needs to progress. In regards to that, Brigadier Harris, I'd like your comments as uh, as uh, how um, um, we talked about. There's uh, efforts for regional connectivity as well. There's the CPEC Phase Two. There's a lot of efforts for economic revitalization. Um, in 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 line of all that, uh, we see that there's um, external factors also at play. As the Governor said, Kamran Tesori, he talked about how the how the Indian agency are backing these militant groups and uh, they're promoting um, instability in the region and radicalism and extremism in the region. How do you comment on that as, um, as these militants having backing and uh, using these uh, propaganda and uh, to exploit people and to further their nefarious agendas? You see, this is a uh, reality. What is happening now, the hostile agencies are working in Bhutan. And the sole purpose is to destabilize Balochistan. Don't let the people satisfied over their character attacks, activities. Initially, you must have seen how so many people were killed when they were coming in buses, that there was labor force from all over Pakistan. I don't call Punjabis or whatever it is. It was the, they were all Pakistani. And then the way Indians are openly saying that we are, we want Balochistan to remain destabilized and we are supporting terrorist activities. We don't want Bhutan should be peaceful because the peaceful Bhutan means we complete CPEC. And if CPEC is complete, means operational, Gwadar airport is operationalized and then the economic activity generates coming from Kashgar and going to Gwadar. And then through Gwadar, it goes to North Africa and Middle East. Likewise, if, Bhutan, if Afghanistan is stable, means we have a regional connectivity with Central Asia. And Russia, Central Asia, then Afghanistan, then Pakistan. Again, the whole world market is available. So this is what they don't want it. That is the problem. We have to be very proactive. Number two, to resolve these issues, to minimize terrorism, we have to go for two, three prong strategy. Number one, we were told you that we have to go for CPEC and inform China that what all we need their support. It's not that you bring your people and then if someone kill, get killed, then you get annoyed with Pakistan. See what you're doing in Afghanistan. You're taking a lot of copper and a lot of mines and minerals from there and give a lot of money to one interim government. And that is being used to destabilize Pakistan also. That is one of the reasons. So that has to be done. And of course, I haven't seen any security conference being held in this region like Central Asia, China, Iran, Pakistan, we have to all sit together to find a solution how Afghanistan has to be stabilized because that is a linchpin. Is Afghanistan is peaceful, mean we have the best of connect connectivity with Central Asia and Gwadar and then Africa and Middle East. So this is what we have to do. Along with this, those national parties, they have to be approached by the federal government and they have to be told what are their uh, grievances. Let's redress them. They are the right people who should go to the universities, colleges, talk to people, convince them what terrorists are doing, how much they're, they're giving you false hoax and false hopes, what, how they show you that a lot of development is going to come up and ultimately land in the barren uh, mountains. This is the language they will understand. And of course, it's going to be economic package. When you have a road development, you have a hospital, you have the uh, hospital, then you have the schools, industries uh, in, in developed then the young youth get the jobs. And if they are having a job, their parents are looked after in their health affairs, children are being educated, then they will never look toward the hostile agencies. So this is the recipe for Pakistan. I think now is the time we go for three, four prong strategies. Military is fighting terrorism. The whole nation must stop to eliminate terrorism from Pakistan. But then these all efforts combined harmonized together is going to be a definitely good dividends.
Definitely, uh, Brigadier Horace Nawaz, um, uh, thank you for your valuable insights. Of course, human resource development, um, uh, national, um, uh, national efforts and regional efforts are the way forward uh, with la that. We'd like to thank you for your valuable insights and being part of the conversation. Moving towards our second segment, we'll be talking about uh, the major economic development that just uh, we unfolded a while ago with regards uh, to the extended fund facility that Islamabad was uh, seeking from the IMF, which the IMF's executive board just approved for the country. With regards to that, Raja Faisal, I'll come to you for your quick comments as uh, we talk about uh, the extended fund facility. What way forward do you think from here? Uh, uh, Rafi, you know, when we talk about IMF program, I mean, uh, it's an extended facility, but of course, we had very extended shows as well on this hmm. uh, aspect. Of course, we have been highlighting each and everything since long. And uh, we, it was expected, I mean, especially when last, uh, last month, uh, Moody and Fitch, they actually improved uh, Pakistan's, uh, uh, obviously, uh, you know, Pakistan actually uh, went to, from positive, uh, from, uh, I think, uh, Farooq, it was, uh, it went to positive from uh, stable. Hmm. And uh, we were already talking about that it is going to be positive plus. Well, this is the day when it, it got positive plus. <laughs> it it has been positive plus now. Hmm. So uh, uh, seven billion dollars, Rafe. It is, uh, I think, a fresh breather for Pakistan's economy. Hmm. And uh, when we used to always talk about that, there were uh, on media and on social media, especially, it was always highlighted the uh, the sound of uh, you know uh, that oh our economy is going to be bankrupt. And uh, since lo last year, I mean, there were wives and there were analysts as well on For the past two years. Yeah, past since two years. Sri Lanka happened. Yeah, mm. and they have been, they have been, of course, uh, you know, coming up with these uh, fake news, and that was hurting our economy on the sides as well. But still, I mean, uh, very tough decisions were made by the current government, and uh, uh, we were hoping that eventually we will. Uh, uh, you know, cross the line, hmm. and now we have crossed the line. Seven billion dollar. Uh, it's it's a huge achievement for uh, Pakistan because it is going to strengthen Pakistan's economy. Not only Pakistan's e e economy is going to be strengthened, but when it comes to economic ties with our friendly countries, of course, they are going to be strengthened, hmm. further strengthened as well. Because we shouldn't be forgetting that our uh, uh, brotherly countries uh, like UAE, Saudi Arabia, and China. Hmm. I mean, we have already been uh, you know getting uh, vibes from them that as soon as we get the, uh, uh, the you know the, this program hmm. uh, of course it would be very positive uh, uh, achievement uh, for in that discourse as well because we will be seeking the rescheduling of uh, our uh, you know uh, remaining debts with them hmm. so that is going to be of i think it is 11 yes. billion dollars that is going to be of course rescheduled uh, with them which would be a fresh breather for our uh, economy as well so it seems that uh, uh, you know days ahead uh, I mean, uh, things are going to be very positive. Well, uh, definitely, it's um, it's a very great news, and of course, a major development as it's going to be celebrated across the country and uh, the trading community. We are going to see in, it's also the the boost in their confidence, and of course, uh, the stock market is also going to show a testament to that uh, tomorrow. But with regards to that, we've been joined by Dr. Nasser Iqbal, who is an economist. I'd like his comments as well. Uh, as uh, Prime Minister Shahbaz Sharif earlier stated, he wants this loan package to be the last one for Pakistan. What, uh, what and how do you see the way forward for Pakistan on from this EFF? Yeah, thank you so much for taking me on this very important issue. That's, yes, the discussion is there and uh, we feel it's good for Pakistan economy for the revival. You know, the, the IMF is always some sort of injection to revive and to push as a big push to the economy. So, yes, we celebrate it as a big push to the economy now. It is up to us that we make this as a last program. For that, we have to really work hard and we have to consider this is as an injection rather than as a like a stability. For stability, we should have to go for a deep reform. We should have to go for some sort of structural reform. We should have to go for some sort of systematic reforms rather than ad hoc or some sort of intervention. So this would be a starting point for us. As you mentioned that there is a some sort of support from uh, the friendly countries like KSA, UAE, China, 
this is a good for pakistan and all economic signal are on the right direction but as a nation we have to stand and we have to work hard to materialize these benefit and we have to transform these into an a productive economy and efficient economy economy that grow economy that flourish and economy that produce not only for domestic purposes but also for the export purposes so our intention in coming years would be to expand our export base to stabilize our economy through domestic investment and also through aggressive reforms in all sector of the economy not only in one sector for example taxation but all sector of the economy we have to create a ease of doing business we have to give an incentive to our local business not through loans through reform through creating an ease of doing business through removing this culture of noc through removing this bureaucratic hurdle through removing this sludge so these kind of incentive that we have to give to our local businessmen that give an indication to international investor that look this economy is on the right track there is a stability in the economy not only at the policy front but at on the political front so we have to work on the both front to create an environment where everyone can feel that this is the country where there is opportunity to earn to make money to invest so that kind of signal we have to promote you have uh, struck this very uh, optimistic note uh, but i uh, just to actually temper that with some realism also uh, this by the way is pakistan's 25th program with imf since uh, 1958 and this is our 6th eff so this idea that pakistan inshallah will be able to get rid of such programs in the future after completion of this one how realistic do you think it is and do you think that why, because uh, we are still in the stage of macroeconomic stabilization and that usually comes at the cost of growth do you think that the government still has the leeway to attract more fdi and ensure that there is economic growth as well yes of course you know that the economy is at the very recession so there is a rebound in the economy there is a always a v shape recovery in the economy so we can easily achieve this 4 to 5% growth with all positive indicator as the inflation is under control there is a decline in the the oil mar oil prices and the stability in the exchange rate these are the indicator that gives some sort of confidence to the local investor so yes despite having this imf program i'm very hopeful if we work on reforms and we declare this year as a reform year i'm 100% sure all these indicator would lead to a positive growth maybe this year we may not achieve a very high growth like 6 7% but at least we can achieve a modest growth that could be our first priority in this year and the coming year we definitely have to increase our productivity because whenever we have high growth we always trap with the the current account deficit we have to avoid this time because there is no further leverage available to us from any country from any development partner from any international financial institution if we fail this time we may not be able to get this time of this type of leverage in the future so this time we make sure that this program is not for the consumption purpose this program is for the investment purpose so we have to divert the priority of this program rather than focusing and spending on the lavish life of our bureaucrats lavish life of our politician lavish life of all kind of other protocol we have to change this narrative we have to change and make sure that each and every penny should be invested and should be invested on those sectors where there is a high return we have to prioritize our agriculture sector we have to make sure that we invest in it sector we have to make sure we investment other kind of e-commerce business where there is an opportunity for the youth to be engaged so the youth would be our future so these kind of activities are needed and should be prioritized within this year and in the coming year 
So invest, uh, don't consume. With that, we'd like to conclude our show. Thank you, Dr. Nasser Iqbal, economist, for being part of the conversation and sharing your valuable insights. For Patafi, senior analyst and geopolitical analyst, Raja Faisal, thank you both for your time as well. With that, uh, we talked about how this uh, Adila Balot's uh, story and how she was rescued from the terrorists. And in the second segment, we talked about a major development and a very good news for Pakistan's economy. IMF approved the $7 billion extended fund facility for the country. See you same time tomorrow. Till then, take care.